Uh, pleasure to be here. This is always an exciting topic to uh, talk about. It is kind of the, uh, the Wild Wild West, as Dr. Fox alluded to, and it's kind of a new, it's not new in the world of ultrasound imaging and, and uh, diagnostics and intervention, but it is kind of uh, still very much uh, unbroken ground, and, and there's still a lot to be learned, and, and there's only really truly a few people in the world who are, should be considered experts in this area. There's, a, there's a, a lot of directions that this is going. And uh, with this particular modality, you, you really need lots, lots, and lots of experience to, to know your anatomy, know the pathology, and be able to really trust this as a, uh, a clinical uh, modality or even replacement for other imaging. And I'm nowhere near that. You know, I'm still learning. I'm still getting started. Uh, I've only been doing it for a few years. but. Uh, I did a lot of it in my fellowship training, um, whether it was diagnostic or uh, interventional uh, image guidance for uh, injections and things like that. Uh, and then only recently starting to do more scans with, uh, with the machine in the office. And so I even have a, a lot to go. And, and um, as we all know, some of the best ways to, uh, to learn something is to teach it. And so I'm really grateful for Dr. Fox to kind of include me in the, uh, in the curriculum. So we're going to talk about just some concepts of uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound. And uh, in particular, we'll, we'll kind of talk about some general principles specific to MSK. And I know you guys have had already some curriculum in terms of knobology and the physics, and we're not going to go into any of that, but I'm going to kind of touch on things that might be specific to MSK ultrasound. Uh, talk about the different tissue te uh, types that you can see uh, with uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound. Uh, and then in particular, talk about kind of the characteristics of those individual tissues, uh, some of the anatomy as we go through as everybody's learned throughout the year, uh, when, you, when you're doing ultrasound, your, your, your handle of the anatomy is, uh, is, is key, and that's, that's very much true for, for musculoskeletal, uh, as well as talk about some of the pathology that we can see. Uh, and in particular, we'll go by some uh, specific anatomical regions and put it in a, a clinical perspective in terms of what I might see in the clinic using ultrasound and how, how I might use this to uh, diagnose uh, injury. Uh, so we've obviously gone a long ways uh, with uh, uh, ultrasound and ultrasound technology, and the machines that we have now are pretty amazing. And this uh, this uh, experiment uh, tomorrow with Sonosite, with all these handheld and the and screen captures and the screen image quality is, is is pretty amazing at this point. So some some general general principles. Uh, we all learn about the different uh, transducers that are used uh, with ultrasound, linear, and curvy linear, and the different uh, different frequencies. With musculoskeletal ultrasound you need the high-frequency linear transducer uh, for a couple reasons. The, the high-frequency uh, gives you better resolution but less penetrance. And so lower, lower frequencies give you more penetrance but less resolution. So with musculoskeletal, we're dealing with a lot of superficial structures. We're not really trying to get too deep. Uh, there are a couple regions where you do have to either switch probes or go to different settings to get more penetrance and get deeper. But in general, with MSK, we're mostly looking for the high frequency, better resolution, less depth. Uh, and, we need, and we need the linear probe because of just the focal points that, that are variable with the curvy linear probes and things. We need a, a broad spectrum view, and so the linear probes are, are important. And there are other specific MSK transducers as well. One's called uh, Hockey Puck. It's just a really kind of small skinny uh, transducer that is uh, helpful for little small digits and things like that. So there are, there are some nuances for MSK as well. There's also something called a standoff pad. It might, be, might have been mentioned at some point during some of your lectures, but when you're looking at the transducers, there's a certain focal point for those sound waves and for the crystals. And the focal point is a particular distance from the transducer, you know, kind of like how our, our eyes function. And so if you have a, like a, if you're imaging a finger, and it's a really, really tiny, small joint, and the probe transducer is right next to the probe, uh, that focal point could be past the joint or, or too deep. And so the standoff pads basically are something that you can put on top of the finger or on top of the area. It brings the probe up off of the uh, anatomical region, and, and it focuses the, uh, the focal point more appropriately. So just something um, a little bit more specific to, to MSK. And in general, there's, uh, as you guys have learned, there's all kinds of different modes for the machine. We tend to use the 2D mode for the basic mode. And then there's the Doppler color flow when you're looking at a lot of the vasculature and, and uh, a blood flow. But there's something called power Doppler, and that's a specific setting on the machine. And power Doppler is used for tissues that kind of have low penetrance of vascularity. And we're looking at um, tissues that tend to have low vascularity, like tendons and ligaments, 
uh, and particular with pathology and different injuries, you're going to see differences in terms of new, new vessel formation and things like that with some of these tendon disorders. And so in general, we're using a, a power Doppler, power Doppler mode. So in general, when we're talking about musculoskeletal ultrasound and, and ultrasound in general, you know, there's, it's, it's a really huge upcoming area because there's a lot of benefits uh, for this imaging modality between uh, the accessibility and just having it in your office and being able to do that real-time imaging, uh, being able to move the tendon and move the muscle, and move the joint, look at the ligamentous laxity and be able to compare that to the other side. And so if I'm looking at, a, uh, like at an elbow, uh -oh. this is uh, Dr. Fox's computer, so I'm not sure what's going on here. Let's see, let's go back down here. Okay. Well, hopefully that will only happen a few more times as we go along. Um, so, so comparative. So if we're looking at ligamentous laxity, I'm looking at, say, an elbow ligament, and I'm worried about a tear. Exam is suspicious for some laxity, but I want to kind of better characterize and figure out how much is, is, is it fully torn, how much laxity is there. I can actually put the probe on the elbow joint, watch and see how much the bones open up, how much that joint opens up when I'm testing a ligament. And everybody has different ligamentous laxity. Some people might be a little bit looser joints than others. So I can then move to the other side, the, the non-injured side, and look how that side moves and be able to see if there's a difference there. And that's real time. You can't do that with an MRI. You can't do that with uh, x-rays. It's, it's, it's comparative. It's in the office. It's cheap. It's safe. Uh, and uh, there's, no, there's no radiation exposure. So a lot of, lot of benefits uh, to, to this modality and having it in the office. Uh, in terms of limitations, though, uh, certainly can be expensive. You know, these machines are not cheap. And if you're, if you're in a private practice or you're, um, you know, you're starting up a practice or even an academic situation, there, there is a significant investment, you know, to these machines. So there's a lot of front-end costs, but, uh, but it, in the end, can kind of pay off in terms of uh, the accessibility for the patient and um, accuracy of diagnosis and, and different uh, accuracy of, of procedures, injections. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Some of the other limitations, though, it, as I was alluding to initially, it really is practitioner dependent. You know, so if if, uh, if the practitioner isn't quite um, in control of their anatomy knowledge or they're not quite uh, experienced with the modality, you know, it requires a, a lot of time and, uh, and and a lot of investment in terms of extra education. And so it, it is something that takes years to get to get comfortable with. And as I mentioned, you know, I'm still I'm still working up to that. Uh, so it is very operator dependent. And you, it's important with ultrasound as well, like any other uh, imaging modality or diagnostic tests in, in medicine in general, is you have to know the limitations of the machine. Is you, can't, you have to know what, you, what it can see and what it can't see, because if you don't see it, uh, it's not maybe because it's not there or the injury is not there. It might just be because you can't see it with ultrasound. So it's really important to know what you can and can't see, what you can trust with the ultrasound, what you can't trust. And there are limitations uh, to the technology, and we'll touch a little bit about on that as we as we go along. Um, and again, that relates to kind of the depth of penetrance and can't can't see through bones or into deep into joints and and things like that. So there are there are limitations. So when it comes to uh, the different types of tissue that you can see with uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound, uh, in general, you know we can certainly see those soft tissue, uh, uh, skin, subcutaneous areas. We see tendons, we can see muscle, we can see ligaments, uh, we can see down to the bony cortex, and we'll go through all these different uh, tissue technique, uh, tissue types as we as we move along. So the first one we'll talk about is is tendon uh, tendon tissues and uh, kind of their characteristic uh, image quality and 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 what you can see in terms of tendons on ultrasound. Uh, this is a, a, a finger flexor tendon. This is the uh, middle phalanx through here, the lining of the, the bony cortex. This is the tendon overlying that, and this is the subcutaneous tissue. So very exquisite, very nice view of, of tendon tissue. So when we're looking specifically at this, there are certain characteristics of, uh, of tendons that you're looking for. So it's a very kind of what we call fibular pattern. So it's uh, uh, the, you can see the fibrils of the tendon tissue kind of interspersed throughout that, that view. Uh, it's very hyperechoic, meaning it has a very strong, denser signal, not quite as much as bone, but, it's, it, but there is a dense uh, uh, hyperechoic image to, to tendons. 
as part of the limitations in knowing uh, what's normal, what's, what's not normal, there are some characteristics of certain tissues that you have to be aware of. And for tendons, there's something called uh, anisotropy or uh, anisotropy, depending on who you are and where you, where you uh, studied. Uh, but it's basically, you, when you're looking at tendons, it should have that very hyperechoic uh, view and that fibular pattern. When you're looking for problems in tendons, sometimes there's disruption of the tissue. It's black, it's dark, you can't quite see it. Uh, but that might be just in anisotropy as opposed to actual tear in the tendon, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and the other nice thing with tendons is, you know, it's again, it's real time, it's dynamic, so you can actually see the tendon move. You can see it move through the whole range of motion of that joint, and uh, you can see if there's any uh, um, disruption in anatomy, you know, at that point. So this is uh, anisotropy, just to talk a little bit about more about that, and we'll see that as we go through the practical scans uh, in, in this afternoon. But what you're what you're looking at here is uh, this is a bony cortex right here. This is the overlying tendon structure. This fibular longitudinal pattern through here uh, with the overlying subcutaneous tissue. Uh, now, what, what, uh, what the practitioner is doing right now is he's, he's bringing the probe from, from what we call heel to toe, so just rocking the probe. And as you do that, what you can see is look at this area here, it goes black, but then it comes back into view with uh, that fibular pattern, goes black, and then comes into view with the normal fibular pattern. So if you, if you paused it there, um, right at, at, at that moment where it's black, you would say, oh my gosh, there's a complete tendon tear, and there's, there's fluid there, but it's actually just anisotropy, and so you just little subtle adjustments, uh, you can see that there's normal tendon tissue there, and so you have to be careful when you're imaging tendons to, to, uh, to look for that when you see possible pathology to change, change positioning and make sure you're not just looking at the uh, anisotropy. Uh, and basically, it's, it has to do with how perpendicular the transducer is to the tendon. And if it's not completely perpendicular, then you're not going to get those sound waves coming back to the crystals, and so it's going to it's going to come out as potential pathology. So again, when you're when you're imaging the uh, the tendons, it should be very nice, consistent, homogeneous tissue, fibular pattern, hyperechoic, and again, you can you can see that tendon move through through its whole range of motion as you flex and extend the joint space. Now, when we look at pathology with tendons and looking for, uh, you know, putting it in the clinical perspective of the patient and looking, is this tendonitis uh, or is this anywhere along the spectrum over to what we call tendinopathy, which is more chronic disorders in tendons. Uh, tendonitis is just that kind of acute process, inflammatory process, and uh, lots of inflammation uh, and swelling. And what, so what you're going to see on the ultrasound is just that fluid, that inflammation, that swelling around the tendon. Uh, as opposed to more tendinopathy or chronic tendon problems, it's going to be more thick tissue, a disruption in the actual uh, tendon uh, tissue and architecture. There's going to be a thickness. Uh, there's going to be changes in that echogenicity uh, in the tendon itself. And I mentioned earlier in terms of that power Doppler, with uh, tendinopathy or chronic tendon problems, there tends to be new vessel formation we call neovascularization in the tendon. So you put that power Doppler on, you can see some of that neovascularization that is uh, specific to that area of pathology as opposed to the rest of the tendon. Um, and then in general, you can see other changes like we, we, we hear about calcific tendonitis. We typically hear about that in the shoulder, rotator cuff muscles. And uh, just like bone, the, the calcific changes that you can see on this, this image here tend to be very thick, uh, uh, hyperechoic structures. So these are calcific changes within the tendon architecture through here. And just like bone, you're going to get a lot of deep shadowing below that very hyperechoic thick tissue because the, the sound waves don't penetrate through. So you see nice, nice normal tendon tissue coming across and you see this calcific change. So a nice example of uh, some of the pathology that you can see. And then when it comes to actual tendon tears, uh, just like any other tissue in the body, muscle, uh, in, in other, other ligaments, you can have partial tears or complete tears, and what you're going to see on, on ultrasound kind of corresponds with that as well. You know, but basically looking for that discontinuity in the fibers, uh, tear within the fibers. Uh, when, when any tissue in the body tears, uh, it's going to bleed, so you're going to see that hematoma, local fluid collection. Uh, fluid basically is anechoic or, or basically no signal, it's black. And so you're going to see this uh, uh, anechoic area or black or fluid collection within uh, the tendon uh, architecture with uh, tearing in the tendon itself. And then, again, it's very dynamic, and so it, it's pretty neat. You can, you can then flex that tendon through its range of motion, and you actually see retraction of the tendon. 
and uh, instead of full no, nice uh, smooth movement. So you can actually see that tear functionally and uh, that can be very helpful to kind of evaluate how significant the tear is. And so this is a, this just an example of a partial tear. Uh, the, it's a little grainy, but this is the normal tendon fibular hyperechoic pattern through here. And then more superficial is this localized hematoma disruption in the tissue uh, um, architecture and, uh, and distension of the tissue with that localized hematoma. So that's that partial disruption with, with focal hemorrhaging. Uh, and then complete tear, basically you, what you can see on this, this image here is this is the, the uh, leading edge of the tendon, should be connecting to this part of the tendon, but there's obviously disruption there, retraction of the tendon, localized fluid collection, and uh, if you were to take that through range of motion, you would basically see that, that tendon stub basically retract, um, and you can see that dynamically. So that can be quite helpful. So we'll move on to muscle. Muscle is another thing that you can see very nicely with ultrasound, very superficial. Uh, just like tendons, muscles have a very uh, specific pattern in terms of imaging. A muscle tends to be a little bit more hypoechoic. It's not as thick, it's not as dense as say a tendon or a ligament. So you, it's more hypoechoic. It has also this kind of uh, fibular pattern, but it, it has to do with kind of the, the interwoven connective tissue within the muscle itself. You know, so on this image here, this is superficial subcutaneous structures. This is the, the uh, connective tissue kind of fascial plane for the muscle. Deep to that is this kind of fibular striated component of the muscle. Connective tissue coming into another fascial, player, uh, fascial layer here. And then deep to that, again, fibular kind of uh, striated aspects of, of the muscle, uh, deep muscle uh, structures. So again, it tends to be uh, more hypoechoic, but then you have that hyperechoic connective tissue fascial planes, and you can see that quite nicely on the, on the ultrasound. Uh, that was a longitudinal view. This is short axis view or transverse or axial view, different terms for that. Uh, again, more, more hypoechoic muscle structure. This is the deep bony structure here. Uh, so superficial that is the muscle, and these are these um, connective tissue dots uh, that in short axis view are referred to as kind of starry night pattern. Uh, you'll hear that um, term tossed around when looking at short axis view for muscle, as that, that starry night is just that interwoven connective tissue. So uh, uh, calf, calf muscle, uh, this is just a nice, nice view, longitudinal view of, uh, of a calf muscle, uh, connective tissue planes, uh, deeper uh, um, fibular pattern of the muscle, muscle here, connective tissue planes. A uh, real, real image, di um, dynamic view, moving across the uh, distribution of the muscle. This example of muscle rupture. So this is a, a complete rupture. Again, just like the tendon, you'll see the retraction or the stub of the actual muscle uh, tissue. So that should be connected to here. These are the fascial planes through here. This is uh, the muscle tissue back here and is retracted. Uh, partial tear, you're going to see... Um, uh, maintenance of those connective tissue fascial planes, but you're going to see that kind of intra-substance partial tearing uh, of the muscle. Again, just disruption of the uh, muscle tissue and maybe localized uh, hematoma. Uh, this is a patient I saw just a couple weeks ago, uh, calf or gastroc uh, tear with uh, a corresponding hematoma. So I'm just moving through the, the spectrum of the, of the hematoma through here, and uh, um, we'll replay that image. back through here. Okay. Uh, so as, as you move along here, you know, any fluid collection or hematoma is going to be compressible and you can use that dynamically to kind of aid in your analysis as well. But uh, what you'll see, and I'll have a later picture of this as we talk about some of the pathology, but you'll see actual disruption in the muscle tissue, retraction of the muscle fibers, and then what you'll see is this kind of corresponding hematoma uh, fluid collection. Uh, this is an image, uh, courtesy of Dr. Fox, uh, of, of a piece of glass that's in the gastroc muscle. So, you know, again, you can see the, the fibular pattern, the normal muscle tissue here, connective tissue layers, and then this uh, foreign body kind of jetting into the muscle tissue. Uh, and just like any other hyperechoic structure or reflective structure, you're going to see that posterior acoustic shadowing. Um, from that, from that uh, glass uh, foreign body. And so nice example of some of the pathology you can see um, on ultrasound. So moving to, to joints and, and uh, more bony anatomy now. Uh, so when we're looking at joint anatomy on ultrasound, it has this kind of characteristic seagull sign. 
So I, I showed this image earlier. So this is the, uh, the PIP joint, proximal interphalangeal joint, and it has this kind of joint space here, proximal joint, articular surface, uh, distal joint, articular surface, and this kind of seagull, seagull bird pattern. So that's just kind of a, uh, a typical thing you'll see at joint spaces and then distally, uh, again, joint space here uh, with distal articular surface here. The, uh, the, the ultrasound does have its limitations in terms of penetrating into the joint. Obviously, there's, there's bony uh, tissue surrounding that joint space, and so you're going to get that uh, shadowing deep to the, uh, to the uh, joint space, so there's going to be some limitations in terms of imaging. But you will be able to see the joint capsule, fluid that's in the joint, uh, fluid distension, and I'll show a couple images of that later. So I mentioned earlier in terms of the uh, application of ultrasound in the office, one of which is you know, using it for image guidance or for joint injections. And we've been doing joint injections for, for a long, long time using surface anatomy and, and your, your knowledge of, uh, of, uh, of that surface anatomy to guide your injection and, and uh, identify the joint space and identify the tendon sheath and identify uh, your soft tissue structures. But it's, it's fairly blind and, and you'll, you'll realize once you start using ultrasound guidance to do injections and then you have to go back and do blind injections, which I had to do after fellowship, it's, uh, it's a little unnerving because now all of a sudden you can't see everything and you can't see where the needle is, you can't see where you're going. And it is really very, very useful because again, it's real time, you're not using fluoroscopy, which is kind of a, a typical modality that guides uh, injection treatment but it's radiation exposure for, for not only the patient, but also the practitioners who do, who's doing it all day. Uh, you can't wheel the fluoroscopy machine in and out of all the rooms. And uh, ultrasound guidance has, is very, very nice, very dynamic, and very useful. And what we'll start to see more of and what's already in the literature is ultrasound guidance versus our traditional surface anatomy or blind injections is much, much more accurate. And there's, there's a lot of literature out there and, it, and it's just growing in terms of not only how, how inaccurate we are with our blind injections, and some of these numbers are, are staggering, you know, upwards of, uh, if we come down the bottom, uh, down into, you know, 60% failure rate, 73% um, failure rate. Now, these are maybe some outliers, but, but still alarming, you know, how potentially inaccurate we can be with our blind injections, as opposed to when we compare them to ultrasound guidance, 68% versus just 3%. Uh, it's, it's strikingly different. And so using ultrasound guidance is, is starting to become a standard of care for, for most joint and soft tissue injections as the modality grows and as more practitioners become comfortable with it. So bones, uh, we can see very well, especially that, that superficial uh, bony cortex structure. And uh, consequently, we can see you know, pathology in bone as well, and in particular fractures. And as you can see on this image here, this is uh, the hyperechoic cortex line uh, for a phalanx. Uh, and you see obvious disruption in that hyperechoic line. And this is just showing a, a phalanx uh, fracture. So again, very easily visualized in ultrasound. And uh, when you're looking for fractures, you just basically see discontinuity in that hyperechoic line. I'll show you some more uh, uh, images of that. But uh, again, when you look at the literature, because it is a, a new modality for imaging in MSK, you know, a lot of people are trying to study this and make sure that we're not just kind of assuming what we can see, making sure we're comparing you know, to standard of care, whether it's x-ray or MRI or arthroscopy, making sure that what we think we're seeing, we actually are seeing. And uh, in most of the studies that are coming out are, are showing uh, quite a benefit to ultrasound and that it's either as accurate or in some cases even more accurate than some of our traditional modalities. And that's true for, for bone as well. And then as you try to put it into a clinical perspective, so, okay, great, I can image it, and I can see the, I can see the fracture, but can I, can I use that to then treat the patient? And when we talk about, especially in an emergency room setting, you know, we're, we're doing a reduction of fractures and closed reduction of fractures, and there's one, this one particular study showing that it can be quite successful with that. So as we run through, the, the normal, normal anatomy for, for bone and intact cortex, again, is that very thick hyperechoic line through here. This bony, bony architecture overlying uh, subcutaneous and muscle tissue. Uh, here is the, again, bony cortex through here, bony cortex through here. Um, and when you, when you get a good sense of what that looks like, and then you actually look at fractures of pathology, it becomes quite, quite obvious uh, where you have, again, that discontinuity and what people refer to as, as step off when you're looking at fractures. Uh, it'd be nice if they were all this obvious. They're not always all that obvious. 
uh, when you're looking at that top right picture. And then this, you know, distal uh, clavicle fracture, uh, you know, very, very common uh, step off type appearance and displacement of the, of the bony, bony fragments. Uh, this is a comminuted uh, radius fracture. You'll see the, the continuity of the cortex line here. And then eventually you'll come into play here where you're shadowing step off to this cortex line here. And then as we move further along, you'll see another step off down to here. So there's basically two fracture lines, comminuted multiple fracture locations. Again, seen very exquisitely with the, uh, with the ultrasound. Not so much, and you actually use the site of a maximal tenderness to, as a guide to where to image on the bone as kind of your protocol to find it. Uh, there's, there's different tissues that, uh, that when you're trying to image, you do have to, or different regions of the body, you do have to put a little pressure. Uh, but most of the time, with, uh, especially with these uh, forearm bones or, or bones that you're typically going to image for uh, fracture uh, visualization, you don't really have to push that hard. You just place the probe. Um, on the on the uh, on the surface of the skin, and uh, and there typically tends to be a lot of fluid collection, you know, and hematomas in association with fractures. And as we know, uh, water and fluid uh, helps the penetration of the uh, of the sound waves, and so it, it, the hematoma actually helps a little visualization of the of the actual fracture. So you don't have to push that hard. And so you, you do find that maximal point of tenderness, and then visualize there. Also, um, sorry if I can interrupt. Sure. Um, with fractures. As long as the bones are not moving around, there's, a, there's usually not that much pain associated with the fracture. I mean, I had a guy a couple nights ago who he had both bones fractured his forearm, and his arm was so angulated, and he, he was just kind of sitting around looking around the room, pretty calm, and everybody kept looking at him like, wow, that looks like it really hurts, but it's when you start to move the bones around, that's where the true pain is. So when you're doing an ultrasound, you put so much gel on it. In fact, you, you can get gel out of the refrigerator. I always keep a bottle in the refrigerator. And so you can put some chilled gel on there and you don't even touch the skin. The ultrasound touches the gel, and then it's actually um, painless to do an ultrasound for, for a fracture, as long as you're not moving the bone. Once you start moving the bones around, then the patient lets you know about it. For sure. All right, so, and then uh, a couple, couple of views, a couple more views of uh, uh, bony discontinuity here. Uh, and then as it relates to um, actual clinical application and reducing fractures, you can see that very well uh, on ultrasound. So this is where the patient would be painful, uh, but hopefully at this point you've done a hematoma block and uh, local anesthesia for the, for the area of the fracture. And then you can see quite nicely as you're moving that fracture location and reducing it, uh, you can see good mobility and visualization of that. And then you can then follow that up with an ultrasound image uh, that shows good uh, post-reduction in anatomical alignment. And if you've ever done this clinically, just by traditional methods, it can be quite, quite cumbersome because you, you get the x-ray, you show the fracture, uh, then you have to kind of have the x-ray up, you're looking at the x-ray, you're trying to visualize the fracture and you're moving it in what direction you feel is appropriate and by protocol, then you have to splint it, then you send them back to x-ray, then they get another x-ray and then they come back, you look at it, or like, oh, shoot, we're a little bit off, got to realign it and then get it good and then splint them and send them back to x-ray. And it's this, this cumbersome process, whereas you put the ultrasound machine on there, you're watching it, anatomical alignment, splint it, and we're all good. You know, and so it can be, be quite useful and, uh, and to the patient's uh, benefit. So now that we kind of have a sense of what tendons are supposed to look like, uh, bones are supposed to look like, muscle, and we've seen a little bit of the pathology, we'll kind of jump into a couple uh, specific anatomical reg uh, regions and get a sense for what you can actually use in a clinical setting and like in my practice, sports medicine practice, what we can see, what certain diagnoses uh, we might be able to use this for and uh, what they look like on ultrasound, just so you guys could get a sense of that. Uh, hand, wrist, and finger is an area that's used a lot, mostly because, again, it's very superficial. You can see a lot of uh, great anatomy and in particular for, you know, some common uh, uh, diagnoses that we use it for, ganglion cysts, a common complaint uh, for, for wrist and hand in, in a, in a uh, clinic visit. Uh, ligamentous disruption, so specific for the hand, you have that ulnar collateral ligament on the, uh, on the thumb, the ulnar aspect of the thumb, um, MCP joint. It can be uh, very easily visualized, and again, that's, that's one area where we use that dynamic imaging. It can be very, very useful for a diagnosis. Uh, tendon injuries, whether it's your extensor or flexor tendons, uh, decor veins, tenosynovitis, a very, very common complaint in the clinic. 
again, can be uh, very easily uh, visualized. I'll show some images of that. And then carpal tunnel uh, is, is, uh, is an area that ultrasound is being used for a lot, not only for uh, imaging, but, but uh, ultrasound guidance for injections of the carpal tunnel. So this is decor veins. Uh, some of these images are a little bit old from, from my fellowship training. But uh, what, what you're looking at here is, uh, so this is the deep uh, bony, bony cortex through here, uh, joint space here. This is the overlying uh, tendon uh, tissue here, the extensor pollicis brevis, which is part of that decor veins complex. You guys will learn about more in the, in the coming years. But there's uh, uh, the EPB is the, uh, one of the tendons involved in decor veins. You can see it very nicely, very superficial. And as I mentioned earlier with uh, tendonitis, you tend to see fluid and collection of that inflammation. And so you're gonna see uh, fluid surrounding, surrounding the tendon. So what, what you have here is, is, is a short axis or axial view of the tendon. Uh, this is that, that little dot of the tendon running lengthwise as you're looking down the tendon. And then what you'll see is this uh, anechoic or fluid collection around the tendon as kind of a halo around the tendon or, or target sign we also refer to as a target sign. And so that's basically fluid that's in the tendon sheath. So that's your tenosynovitis. And uh, you can see that very, very nicely uh, on the ultrasound. And then um, this is an ideal uh, depiction, but uh, basically you're, you're imaging the tendon, you can see the tendon sheath, and then you can see your needle slip into that tendon sheath and see infiltration uh, of the fluid around the tendon itself. Uh, also nice to uh, ensure that you're not actually in the tendon. So intratendinous injections are contraindicated, especially if you're talking about cor cortisone. Uh, certain modalities you're actually trying to, uh, to target the tendon itself, but in general, you're trying to get that, that medicine around the tendon, but not actually in the tendon. And you can see that quite nicely when you're using ultrasound guidance. It can be quite helpful. Uh, so around the elbow, a couple you know, very common diagnoses, whether it's tennis elbow or, or golfer's elbow, lateral epicondylitis or medial epicondylitis, uh, there's multiple names for it, but uh, you, can, you can image those areas uh, quite well. So this is the distal humerus. Uh, humeral radial uh, joint or capitellar radial joint radial head and this is the extensor tendon coming in and attaching on the humerus uh, lateral epicondyle here so superficial deep bone structure tendon tissue coming across the joint space and attaching onto the lateral epicondyle so that the tinnitus elbow is really a tendon disorder and so the epicondylitis uh, is a little bit of a misnomer but what you're dealing mostly with is tendon uh, pathology or tendon abnormalities and so on tennis elbow, a lot of times you can visualize that tendon quite nicely. And this tendon has this uh, fluid collection here, disruption of normal tendon fibular pattern. It's a little bit thicker. So this is a, a tendinopathy or probably a chronic tennis elbow. And you can see that quite nicely here. And again, you can direct uh, injection treatments um, in other modalities, new modalities like platelet-rich plasma and some of these things you guys have probably heard about. Uh, and you can use the ultrasound guidance very well for that. Again, ligamentous disruption, ulnar colloidal ligament on the inside of the elbow. Uh, again, this is one area, like in our baseball pitchers, we wanna know how much laxity is there. You can see that real-time dynamic imaging as that joint space is opening up and flexing open. You can see that on ultrasound. Uh, as well as uh, since uh, you can image the joints very well, you can see joint effusions and joint co uh, fluid collections. So around the shoulder, uh, this is an area that has been studied a lot because this is uh, one area that is, is very common uh, diagnosis and clinical complaint, you know, shoulder pain, shoulder impingement, rotator cuff tendonitis, a big reason why patients come into the clinic and a big reason why we order a lot of MRIs. And so people are trying to find out, can we use ultrasound in the office, avoid MRIs, avoid healthcare costs? And is it a reliable modality to diagnose these rotator cuff tears or rotator cuff tendinopathies? And what we're finding with the literature is that it is very accurate and very reliable. And uh, with sensitivity and specificity numbers that are, are quite remarkable in some cases, a very, very, very uh, reliable modality. Um, a little bit more reliable for full, thic full thickness versus partial thickness tears. Again, the, the pathology is gonna be very much more obvious when there's a full, full tear as opposed to partial tears. But, but either way, very accurate. And as you guys go through your training, you'll kind of get a sense for kind of good and bad sensitivities and specificities. And these are, these are quite good numbers when you're looking at reliability. Um, also around the shoulder, you can see biceps tendinopathy. We can look a little bit about at that uh, when we go through the uh, practical uh, portion, as well as AC joint arthropathy. 
uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is biceps tendon. This is kind of a short axis long view of, of uh, I'm sorry, a short axis view of the long head of the biceps tendon as it comes up through that bicipital groove in the shoulder. So this is the, uh, this is the humerus, um, and uh, this is the bicipital groove between those humeral condyles. And the biceps tendon sits right in this little groove here. And it's a very easy thing to image, and we'll, we'll show you guys that during the practical component. But it's a, it's a very, very easy way to identify that biceps tendon. Uh, and you can see uh, uh, if there's any pathology in the biceps tendon. You can see if there's that target sign. So this is what I was talking about earlier. So this is the biceps tendon in the middle, surrounding fluid. And then you have the overlying um, uh, subscapularis tendon and underlying uh, humeral cortex. So you see this uh, kind of target sign or tenus synovitis or fluid collection around the tendon. You see that quite nicely um, on, on these uh, um, bicep uh, imaging. And this is just the humeral head going into external internal rotation. And as it comes into external rotation, you can see the subscapularis coming across the top. So very easily imaged uh, rotator cuff tendons on, on this modality. And you can see, that, uh, see it quite well. So AC joint is kind of interesting one when it comes to ultrasound because it seems like a very superficial joint, very easy thing to inject, but it's also very, very small. And sometimes uh, body habitus doesn't allow you to locate it quite well. And if you remember one of those studies in the literature review I showed uh, was one study looking at AC joint injections and the failure rate was, was uh, pretty high. And so you're trying to get this little 25 gauge needle into this really tiny joint, you're usually doing it in the setting of joint arthritis or calcific changes, that's what you see here. So this is the AC joint. Uh, this is uh, uh, clavicle, this is the chromium process, this is the AC joint, uh, joint space. Uh, this is uh, part of the joint fluid, calcific changes. And if you're trying to get in not only to a small joint, but there's a bunch of calcium and bony spurs around it, it can be kind of hard. But you put, that, you put that ultrasound probe right on top of the shoulder, you see exactly where that joint is, and then boom, you, you, can, you can head right at it. Uh, and, it, and it's a uh, quite easy injection to do with uh, ultrasound guidance as opposed to without. The uh, hip and groin is another area where ultrasound is uh, being used more and more, especially in the uh, sports arena for either intraarticular injections, uh, you know, again, avoiding uh, uh, fluoroscopy and radiation exposure. The uh, more superficial diagnoses, uh, trochanteric bursitis, which is one of the most common hip complaints that I see in the clinic. A uh, very easy injection to do under ultrasound guidance. You see exactly where you're going, very superficial structures, uh, as well as muscle injury. You know, so here's uh, uh, adductor muscle tear and uh, adductor associated uh, adductor tendon. Uh, so you see this uh, collection of hematoma, uh, tissue disruption, uh, and um, retraction of, of tissue uh, in the area of tear. And the, the, the groin and the hip is an area where MRI is, is uh, traditionally less reliable and it's very hard to image some of these subtle uh, muscle weaknesses or muscle fascial herniations. And there's things like sports hernia, which is this very uh, nebulous topic where you could have pathology involving either uh, hernia structures or muscle tears or uh, tendon tears and a lot of different things that can happen in sports hernia that very traditionally is not imaged on MRI, but we see very well with ultrasound. And uh, these are some of the uh, muscle tissues that sometimes can be involved in uh, sports hernia that you can see quite well uh, with uh, ultrasound. Uh, another very common source of pain in the groin uh, in athletes particularly is a uh, um, osteitis pubis or just kind of chronic changes at the pubic, uh, pubic symphysis, inflammation. And the best way to, to kind of work through your differential on that is to inject it. And it's obviously a sensitive area to inject that you kind of want to have image guidance to inject. And you can see it quite well on ultrasound and use ultrasound guidance for those injections. Uh, and then lower extremity, a uh, whole laundry list, this isn't even all of them, of things that you can use ultrasound for with the lower extremity. Whether it's uh, your tendinopathies, again, patellar, patellar tendinitis or patellar tendinopathy, Achilles tendinitis or tendinopathy are, are very, very common diagnoses uh, for patients coming into the clinic, especially in sports. And you can see uh, a, a, these tendon structures very well. This is patella tendon. Uh, so this is the uh, inferior pole of the patella coming down through patellar tendon and then patella tendon attaching on the proximal tibia or the tibial tubercle. So uh, very, very well imaged. This is that retropatellar area where you have the fat pad and a bursa. And uh, you can see the, the anatomy quite well. You can see LCL quite well. You can see MCL quite well. You can't see ACL, PCL. Again, you know, limitations of your modality and knowing what you can use it for.
but you can see it for meniscus. And then around the ankle, you can visualize that those peroneal groups, uh, ATFL, anterior talofibular ligament, you know, all the, all the common ligaments and structures that you see in, in, your, in your common ankle sprains. Uh, all these bristle sacs tend to be very superficial. You can image those quite well. And uh, again, those muscle tears, muscle strains, full ruptures, hamstring, very, very common injury in sports, hamstring tears. You can see that quite well on, uh, on ultrasound. So ligamentous injuries, uh, this is a kind of a depiction of a normal MCL. So this is joint space here, femur, tibia, and uh, MCL. MCL uh, ligaments look very similar as tendons. You have that fibular pattern, but it's a little bit more hyperocoque, a little bit more dense uh, than, than tendons. So this is this dense ligamentous structure coming across here. Uh, this is uh, proximal uh, femoral uh, condyle MCL coming distally. And this is an example of MCL tear. So this is a distal MCL tear. So this is the joint space here, MCL coming across, and then you see disruption of the, of the tissue here. And then distally, you see no longer any ligamentous um, tissue. So it's basically retracted proximally. So very well seen on, the, on the ultrasound. I mentioned earlier that you can see some meniscus pathology. So this is uh, the joint space here, femur and tibia. Uh, this is the joint capsule or fusion. Again, you can see distension of the, of the intraarticular fluid, uh, joint swelling. And this is the meniscus that's basically displaced. It has meniscal cysts in here. So you can see a lot of meniscus pathology uh, on ultrasound. But there certainly are zones of the meniscus that are deeper that you can't quite image, and in, in which case you have to rely on your MRI to uh, image those areas. Uh, this is an example a patient I saw a couple weeks ago, joint effusion, just kind of classic uh, presentation of knee arthritis, acute exacerbation, lots of pain, lots of swelling in the knee. This is that uh, suprapatellar pouch of the joint space. So uh, the knee joint space extends pretty far above the knee on that suprapatellar pouch. And when you have a joint effusion, that area can be extended uh, or distended. And this is the fluid collection in there. So all fluid with uh, some joint debris uh, floating around. You know, this is just a chronic kind of classic osteoarthritis presentation, seen quite well, long axis view, axial view. This is the femur right here, hyperchoic line. Incredibly common, I see this all the time in emergency departments. Yeah. yeah, and what's nice is you know, when you're doing then, uh, you're either aspirating, you know, not all of them are, are, are straightforward. You know, is this infection, is this gout, is this just arthritis? Uh, is this uh, acute hematoma? There are a lot of different things that can cause a joint effusion. So if you need to aspirate that fluid, uh, very easily identified, you know, okay, that's where the superteller pouch is. There's the swelling. Stick the needle right there, and you're, and you're right on it. And so very easily visualized and uh, very applicable to a clinical setting. So this is that, that calf hematoma I showed earlier, the hematoma formation. Uh, this is the retraction of that, of that calf muscle. So this is the same patient here. Uh, with retraction of muscle tissue, muscle tear. Uh, and this is contiguous with this hematoma formation here. Um, this is another uh, high school athlete of mine. So, so great, great uh, example of accessibility of this ultrasound modality and, and as it becomes more portable. So when I go see kids in the high schools in the training rooms uh, where we don't have x-rays in the high school or MRIs in the high school, and a lot of these kids don't have even insurance, aren't plugged into the system, Sometimes it's really frustrating and difficult for me to get an x-ray for a kid or get an MRI for a kid, but I, have the, I can take that ultrasound machine in the training room and then slap it right on the, on the kid's hamstring, and, and boom, we got the hamstring tear. Uh, very well visualized. You can see the extent of it. How big is it? How big is the hematoma? How fast, how aggressive can we be with this kid? And uh, I don't have to worry about um, him getting uh, secondary imaging and going through all the hassles with that and expense to the family, et cetera. So this is one of my high school athletes just a few weeks ago with an acute hamstring tear. This is a patient I saw on Tuesday, comes in six months of uh, Achilles pain, heel pain, a runner, and is, is basically uh, at wit's end because he can't get back to his training, lots of pain. And uh, what we're showing here is basically the, uh, the distal Achilles tendon coming down to calcaneal insertion here. Uh, so the earlier movie was just basically showing the continuity of the tendon, very healthy tendon. Uh, this is a short axis view of the tendon here, calcaneus hypercoque line here. And what you can see is the, the calcaneal insertion, uh, Achilles tendon coming down here, and you're getting disruption of normal architecture. This was not in a, in a satrapy. 
uh, as, as I you know, move the probe around, that discrepancy stays there. That's a flu localized fluid collection disruption of the insertion. And insertion of Achilles tendinopathy is a very common diagnosis and very easily uh, visualized on, on ultrasound. Uh, this was a baseball player a couple weeks ago, got hit in the shin with baseball, kind of classic uh, uh, tibial contusion. Um, not necessarily something you would typically image clinically, but just a very a good example of what you can see on ultrasound. So I imaged it. And what you see here is short axis view of the tibia, uh, long axis view of the, of the tibia through here. And you can see the uh, superficial subcutaneous uh, uh, collection of fluid from the hematoma, from tissue disruption, hematoma here. And here you can actually see a little bit of uh, tissue debris. Sometimes with these hematomas, you get thickening of the tissue uh, and a collection of tissue debris, uh, which can sometimes cause other complications, which you could follow on ultrasound. Uh, that you might not necessarily see on, on x-ray or other imaging modalities. So take home points for MSK ultrasound. A lot of uh, uh, benefits for, for this modality, especially in the world of MSK and the world of sports medicine, that real-time accessibility, very safe, and has a lot of applications for MS MSK uh, uh, imaging. Uh, you can image all kinds of different tissues. And uh, it's important to keep in mind, though, as you're imaging those different tissues and you're looking for pathology, that you have to realize not only your personal limitations, but also limitations of the ultrasound machine. You know, as you get more and more training and more and more comfortable with the, uh, the modality. Uh, there are lots of instances in uh, musculoskeletal medicine where this is as accurate as other imaging modalities, and in some cases can even replace those imaging modalities, and in some cases is even better. Uh, for imaging some tissue uh, examples. And as I mentioned, it's uh, in some cases becoming almost standard of care now for ultrasound guidance for some of these uh, joint and soft tissue injections we used to do routinely uh, blindly. So lots of applications, very exciting field, still very, very much the wild, wild west of ultrasound imaging, uh, but we're, we're learning more and more as we go along and, and uh, we're all trying to get better, better adept at using this modality. So that's it, any questions? Thank you.